Good evening. Uh, Bruce Arrell's my name. I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit. And my guest tonight is Dr. David Kadaya, um, who's the lead psychiatrist for the National Telehealth Service and also the resident psychiatrist at East Tamaki T Healthcare. And I always, David's one of my favorite psychiatrists because he really understands primary care. So I think uh, it's great to have him tonight. Um, this sort of came about because we bumped into each other at the gym and he was telling me about all these phone calls he's getting on the National Telehealth Service. And then um, a colleague from Middlemore had suggested um, that we do a webinar. So we decided to do a webinar because of the events of Christchurch and call it the managing of the acutely distressed patients, which I'm sure um, you've been seeing um, in your practice or staff or staff members. Um, so David, I thought we might just uh, say what, and or oh, the other thing I was going to say, we're focusing on patients tonight, not on wider issues of gun control or international politics. So we want to keep this patient focused today. So what's been your reaction to all these events? How, how has it affected you? Look, I think like a lot, well, I mean, I've been immersed in it because of the the huge upswing in demand at the telehealth service, particularly 1737, and us gearing up to be able to respond and to be able to continue to answer calls within 20 seconds, which is the goal. Um, so it was really interesting that over the course of the Friday afternoon and evening and Saturday, I was just immersed in all that. And then I got my head out of that on the Saturday afternoon and I saw a, um, a, a post pop up on the family Facebook chat of Sarah putting flowers at a local mosque and I suddenly became tearful. And it was just a really surprising thing. But I mean, I think it was a reflection mm. of how so many people mm. around this country have been incredibly touched by this event. Mm. And as terrible as it is, I mean, what we've seen is an amazing outpouring also of mm. kind of support and in a way of kind of people opening up their arms to others in a way mm. that they might not have mm. otherwise. So um, it's been been pleasantly um, unifying, I think. Um, for most of us. Yeah, yeah. No, um, as I was telling David, I wrote a haiku for Jacinda Ardern, and it starts off with Jacinda's arms around us. And that's how I've felt during this, that uh, she sort of had her arms around us as a nation. And I mean, in, in, in psychological terms, that notion of being contained is an incredibly mm. positive one, isn't it, for mm. people? Mm. Um, so I think that, yeah, mm. I mean... As I, as I said before, if, if there is any defining moment in what makes a state's person, then I think for her this is probably it. Mm, mm. Yes, because I think we've all gone through this. You know, I, I find myself going through phases of sadness, grief, yeah. guilt, anger, wanting to get revenge. There's all those sort of things keep coming up. And I think um, I imagine that's what's been happening with, with the audience out there. So I wonder if we could start... Um, uh, with um, just some of the the um, cases you've been getting on the on the telly, that's amazing. You answer them within twenty seconds. That's pretty. We, we kind of always, and at peak times, it gets to be over that. Mm. But certainly, that's the target. Um, so, look, I mean, yeah, I, I don't normally obviously spend time on the phones there, but as part of the kind of everyone getting to the pump, um, there have been a number of psychiatrists who've actually ended up volunteering and spending time on the phones there, and so it did give me a really good feel for what was going on out there. Um, so, I mean, it's been really interesting that obviously those who were the kind of victims, who were bereaved, who were passers-by and involved in the aftermath and the first responders and, and the hospital staff is one group of people who obviously had witnessed slash experienced an incredibly traumatic event. Um, but beyond that, um, it's been kind of really sad that the Christchurch community as a whole, so many people had had lingering kind of low grade impact of the trauma of those two earthquakes. And this has re-evoked a lot of that kind of hypervigilance and sleep difficulties, anxiety and so on that followed on for that for many people. So that's been a second big thing that's been seen. The third is the people who, of those who had actually advertently or inadvertently watched the live feed um, that had been shared. Um, and a, a subset of those people have had quite substantial post-traumatic stress type symptoms in the aftermath of that. 
The fourth big thing has been people around the rest of the country who've had some kind of past traumatic, major traumatic event slash PTSD, and whom it's just re-triggered kind of that whole trauma um, response, particularly, obviously, in refugee communities, particularly, you know, of whom many are Muslim anyway, um, many of whom had had a, a huge amount of trauma that experience prior to rocking up in our supposedly safe nation. So, so it's been a really broad array of um, people who have called in with distress. So any ones in particular that you can think of? So what the, uh, the Case, cases? Yeah, give yeah. us a case like yeah. an acutely distressed uh, person phones up. How do you handle that initially on, on the telephone? I mean, I often call, use the term decompressing people. Yeah. Um, so look, I mean, um, you know, let's just use the example of um, someone who was one of the was driving past and saw a body on the side of the road um, and he was very distressed by this and having a range of emotions feeling you know upset at what he'd seen angry at what had happened angry at how could this happen and now you know in my city and so on um, so a, a lot of the a lot of the important response after a traumatic event is really a series of simple things. Firstly, normalising our human emotional responses in these events, and and often people kind of feel like they're going crazy and just reassuring that they're not. These are normal human reactions. The second thing is really um, encouraging the kind of help seeking, reaching out to your support network. Um, and, and to share how you feel. And the important thing here is actually sharing how you feel rather than over and over describing the event. What we know from early approaches to so-called debriefing where people are encouraged to really talk about a traumatic event in the aftermath of it is that actually, if anything, it prolongs recovery. Whereas talking about feeling how you feel and support from others tends to, to, to speed recovery. Um, the third important thing is really keeping to routines, you know, eating at normal times, going to bed at normal times, doing your normal things, um, and also distracting yourself through normal activities, be it exercise, going to work, and so on. Um, so all of that being really important. The, the, the fourth um, thing, which we were kind of careful about in terms of who we were talking about, and with the print material advice didn't say, but it's actually not drinking more to get to sleep or whatever at a time like this, because actually, um, if anything, that's probably going to impede recovery. And the fifth thing is just leaving people a message that these things pass over days to weeks. You should expect that um, that you will feel better day by day over the coming week and beyond. But if you are not, if you are really distressed by this to a point where you're struggling with function, then reach out for help sooner rather than later. Um, and that's just the general advice that we've given. And um, for anyone who wants to direct patients, there is also loaded up in the ministry website where there is both self-care advice for people affected and also advice for parents around how to support their children after a traumatic event. It's an important, incredibly important bit of advice, that thing. I, I always say the term I use is keeping your world expanded because yeah. the natural human response to yeah. distress is just to the shut contract. the life down. But I That's say right. when I'm teaching the medical students, I say when you have an exam, you shut your lives down. That's completely appropriate. <clears> but <throat> you've got to open it up afterwards yeah. um, and keep your life. In fact, interesting, just talking about the gym, one of the things in my own life, when I don't want to go to the gym, I have learned I just go to the gym. It's, it's my the first sign yeah. that I'm getting under stress is I don't want to go to the gym. But if, if and I've learned the hard way. I just go now. That's yeah. the best thing. Well, funnily enough, I mean... I'm almost the opposite. Like the first thing I did after I got home, well, actually I went for a run rather than to the gym, mm. but I just felt like I need to burn off all this kind of mm. tension that is in me from the events of the past, um, you know, 24 hours or so. So David, we've got a, a question here. Uh, how about helping adolescents work through what they saw on the live stream? And you were talking to me about the live stream issue when, yep. before we yep. started tonight. Yep. So look, I mean, we we as a team at the telehealth service were really concerned about this as an issue. In fact, some informal kind of canvassing of, as you do, your kids and their friends and 
colleagues, kids and friends, suggests that actually most kids, this has not been as highly traumatizing as we as parents might have been concerned. But undoubtedly, there will be kids out there for whatever reason who have been affected. So, I mean, in terms of the parental advice, which I think equally applies to um, people working in the health sector, is firstly, our natural inclination is to kind of protect kids and teens from difficult things, isn't it? But the reality is that the most helpful thing you can do is encourage them to talk about particularly how they felt. So how did they feel when they were seeing this? And secondly, as with adults, really just encouraging them reaching out for support through their own networks, keeping to their usual routines, not resorting to drug alcohol use as a coping mechanism, um, using um, things like exercise and so on to, to um, feel better. Um, and, but I mean, most, most importantly, I think as a health provider, it's just really to give people permission to talk about this and also to ask how they're exper what they're experiencing and to just normalize it as much as possible. Mm. So, um, I mean, it's really interesting. I am talking about this with my primary care team of 30 odd people um, at our weekly peer review yesterday. I was talking about the whole thing of normalizing the post-traumatic stress response. And I said to the group, so who in this room has actually experienced any PTSD symptoms after at least one traumatic event in their life? About half of us had, including mm. me. Mm. Um, and um, so, but I think for young people, it's really important to know that these are normal responses and um, that they pass. Um, mm. But but I think the really important proviso is really that if it's causing you so much distress that you're struggling to function or that you're not able to sleep at all, that kind of thing, then that's a signal of, of actually reaching out for help mm. of a more professional kind. Mm. Okay, so we've got a, a, another question here um, about dealing with the acutely distressed person in a 15-minute consult with an interpreter in a busy practice. Um, well, I think the issue of interpreters is um, a whole thing in itself, isn't it? But do you have any sort of suggestions around that one? Look, I mean, in a way, I should do a hospital pass to you for that one because you're the one who has to do it in 15 minutes. I don't. But um, so I'm very fortunate in that regard. Um, but um, I mean, I, I would have said the important thing is you just do the best with the time you've got. Mm. You try and normalize particularly. And also, I referenced before the resources up on the Ministry of Health website. They are translated into quite a number of languages now, particularly languages of the, um, the Muslim communities. I think the link to that is coming up later. So that's an incredibly helpful resource that's been developed since the, um, the events of last Friday. Mm. Another question here. Um, this is from a physio and Pilates instructor. Should we encourage clients to talk about it or discourage it? What would be your advice to them? So look, as I said, I think that the idea is to encourage people to talk about how they're feeling and what mm. they're experiencing, but to not encourage them to talk particularly over and over about that, what they saw, mm. the traumatic event. Mm. Um, so um, that's the general advice that um, you know, as you said, when we're distressed, we tend to naturally want to contract our lives. Mm. Mm. Many people feel, you know, embarrassed or ashamed about about sharing distress. But actually, the healthiest thing we can do at a time of distress mm. is to share it. Mm. We're social animals. Mm. And, um, you know, sharing distress tends to reduce it, whereas mm. talking over and over about a traumatic event tends to uh, um, mean that it persists in our consciousness rather than retreating into memory mm. as mm. Um, events normally do. Well, it's interesting. I mean, one of the, the, the treatments for PTSD is exposure therapy. And I guess talking about it in a supportive environment is part of that exposure therapy yeah. in a funny sort of way, isn't yeah. it? I just, yeah. I just thought about that now. Got another question here. Um, yeah, so really you're saying to the physios and Pilates, they're, they're like any other health pr practitioner, uh, share your humanity, really. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not rocket science. It's just be yeah. human. Because I think actively avoiding it and diverting conversation would be worse. I think the person would look, feel really not heard. Yeah. And look, I mean, it's been amazing um, both among the team at telehealth, mm. the, the tears, but also at times last mm. year, mm. but also actually for me and observing for others over the course of the day and a half mm. I was on the phone last week, um, was that I was 
on the verge of tears talking to people mm. at times, but also mm. having a laugh mm. at times as well. Mm. So, so I mean, mm. I think that that within kind of a limited way, sharing our humanity helps to normalise mm. other people's experience. Well, as our keynote from a couple of years ago, David Cool from Vancouver says, the important thing is people need to be seen, heard, and understood. Still and right. I think it's if, not rocket if, science. No, right. no, and I think if we uh, share our humanity, so. Um, physios and Pilates instructors go for it. Um, sometimes we ourselves get upset when we hear traumatic stories. Is it okay for us to try? I have trouble not crying when I'm upset. You just sort of mentioned tears before there, but what's where, where do we... Um, so, so look, I mean, I think that um, we have to manage our own distress in healthy ways. Mm. Self-care, I mean... I mean, I always say of people working in the health space that your capacity to care for others is no greater than your capacity to care for yourself. So we have to really care for ourselves. And if we're very distressed, take that offline. And certainly at times, that's what we have done over the last week with the telehealth team. We've just taken people quietly offline mm. and, and, you know, the, the, and supported each other. Mm. Um, but, I mean, the other side of that coin is that a small amount of distress, which is not going to feel like it's just overwhelming mm. to the other person, I mm. think can be a really healthy, helpful mm. thing. Mm. Um, Robin Youngson at the Compassion Conference last a couple of weeks ago talked about how we are often wi with patients. And I, I said to him, actually, I think we're Bluetoothing more with patients. You know, it's actually going back and forth between us. And mm. I think uh, I'm a few, I, I tend not to cry very often, but I, I, I have had tears with patients when, when yeah. something's been really sad. Yeah. And I think that's probably really affirming to somebody, yeah. actually. Yeah. You know, my suffering is so great that the, the GP or the health professionals crying too, you know. Well, I mean, I think that people feel a touched mm. by that. Mm human mm. connection mm. but also be incredibly normalized and you know one of the one of the real um difficulties in the mental health space is that people feel that having symptoms of distress and so on is credibly abnormal mm. and yet actually it is part of the human experience i don't know how we've kind of got to this place mm. where people feel that distress or you know symptoms of stress or anxiety or having a panic attack or, I mean, yeah, th those are abnormal experiences. Um, and so the more we can encourage people to feel that it's a part of the, the kind of shades of, hu of being a human, um, the better it will be. Well, Russ Harris has a book called The Happiness Trap, which has sold half a million yeah. copies. Yeah. And he talks about that. And in fact, what we need to do is be living our life according to our values and getting on with it not wanting to be just happy because yeah. that can be yeah. a very short-term transient thing yeah. buying a new outfit buying a new car um buying something those, those sort of things are, are transient happinesses yeah. a bit of a trap got a long question here with primary age children how much information should be given schools are currently struggling with this in canterbury i have some young clients who have developed considerable anxiety due to misinformation yeah, but it is a fine line with school. Thanks. So, look, I mean, that's an incredibly good question, really. I mean, I'm sorry to keep directing people to that Ministry of Health resource, but I think that what is there just as sensible advice for teachers. In fact, um, a colleague at the telehealth service whose sister is a teacher in a um, in a Christchurch secondary school had asked for some advice and. Joe forwarded her that document and she said, you know, this needs to go to every school in the country, certainly right now every school in Christchurch. But look, I mean, basically the simple thing is this. You know, as I said before, our instinct is to protect kids from mm. upsetting things. Actually, kids are incredibly astute and they know when you're lying. <laughs> and yes. Even if you're not always aware when you are to yourself. Um, and so what we have to do is, number one, we have to be honest. Mm. But number two, we have to, expl we have to reassure them that they are safe and that the adults in their lives will keep them safe. Number three, explain in, in general terms and language they can understand. So if it's primary school at children, just simple concepts um, about what has happened and, you know, that everyone is very upset about it and it is normal to be upset about it. Encourage them to ask questions because kids often feel very reassured by being able to ask questions and having them responded to. Encourage them to share how they feel um, because, again, that is very helpful. 
encourage them, and this applies to the question about adolescence as well, encourage them to get off the news, um, particularly if it's distressing, and to actually take a break from social media because social media was actually, has been swamped with um, posts and stuff about this, mm. hasn't it? So um, all of those things, I think, are an important part of mm. um, how to support children affected through this. Yeah. Just got a, a question there from a person, I'll just give their initials, J-O. I, I can't quite understand your question. Could you rewrite it so that I could understand it? Um, uh, how to discern, another question here, how to discern between distress, anxiety disorder, and depression in initial GP consult? This is the area I'm very interested in. Yeah. <laughs> Where you go? Well, look, I would have said in this context, um, you're best to actually assume distress first um, and to um, to normalise it as a, a normal reaction and to reassure that it is something that will pass. But I think the key thing that would kind of draw a bit of a line in the sand between the normal response from the response that may need something more than just the general self-care is really when you, it is to the extent that your day-to-day -day function is impaired. So you you can't get your head into work or you're so, you know, distressed that you're bursting into tears in the middle of workplace, mm. that kind of thing. Mm. Um, mm. And um, that's when, I guess, you might want to look a little bit closer at what's going on. Because, of course, if you've had past depression, PTSD, severe anxiety, then this events like this can then re-trigger mm. significant levels of, of symptoms. Mm. But, I mean, honestly... For most people, actually, the thing that is going to be causing them the big, most amount of grief is actually just not sleeping in the face of yes. all of this distress. Yes. And sometimes the simple giving of a few days of a hypnosedative to just restore sleep is all it will take to actually mm. get the person through. So I would kind of discourage thinking too much about, you know, significant severe depression or significant severe anxiety. Mm in that first kind of week or so. Yeah. But actually, I'm interested in your thoughts. Okay, well, I've got a wonderful audio which will stick on the site. It's from Alan Francis. He's an American psychiatrist, and he was at the overdiagnosis conference run by the BMJ last right. year. This was a podcast, <laughs> and he was speaking to me when he said this, honestly. He was on the DSM-3, he ran the DSM-4, and he's highly critical of the DSM-5. Yeah. But he says, in primary care, you're often seeing people on the worst day of their lives. Yeah. And you often got a very short space of time. You wouldn't buy a car in that space of time. Um, and you shouldn't be giving people labels in that space yeah. of time. And with a bit of time, most things will sort themselves out. There's no hurry. I think it's much more important, as you sort of suggested, to look at the functional deficits. If there's a sleep problem, then some sleep hygiene and mm -hmm. also medication. Yeah. If they've stopped seeing their friends, encourage them to yeah. go out and friends. If they've stopped exercising, they need to exercise. So they, they need to start doing the good things they've stopped <laughs> doing and stop doing the things like and yeah. alcohol and yep. smoking cannabis. Not, and I say to people, this isn't a moral thing. It's a health thing. Yeah. In fact, one of the questions I say to people is, say, well, I, I, I drank alcohol all day. And I just say, well, did that help? And they invariably yeah. say, no, it is yeah. really yeah. interesting. Does that help? And, it, of course, it is a natural response to acute distress to start mm. um, to start increasing alcohol intake. So it's always worth saying, has there been an increase, if you're asking about alcohol oh. and things? Look, I mean, I went home that night and uh, on the Saturday, and what I felt like doing was having a stiff gin. <laughs> I went for a run, but what I felt like doing was that. It's We all, well, many of us do, don't we? So, well, that's our thing. Trust your experience rather than what your mind's telling <laughs> yeah. you. We've got to stop yeah. listening to our minds. Yeah. And you know, the last time you went for a run, you felt good, yeah. probably. Um, question here, does it help to use a sleeping tablet for a few nights? I mean, you've just sort of answered that to an extent. Look, I, I, think, I think in the broad scheme of things, going through a period of insomnia, um, sleep hygiene is mm -hmm. the most important thing. Mm -hmm. But I do think when people are highly distressed after a traumatic event and really, really, it's not just it's taking a bit of time to get to sleep, they're actually having, um, you know, most of the night awake, then I do think that just mm -hmm. re-establishing sleep for a few days mm -hmm. can be incredibly helpful just in terms of, feeling better, reducing distress, and kind mm. of in hastening recovery. Absolutely, because otherwise they're sleep deprived during yeah. the day, and of yep. course that, that, that makes best, it. Then, are we? Um, a question here about hypnosedative of choice, so we had a wee chat about that beforehand, so maybe you'd like to lead on that one. 
Look, I mean, for, for really short-term use, I think most people tend to prescribe Zopiclone, don't they? And I think mm. that's that's probably the best of mm. a bad bunch, really. Mm. Um, mm. I think So I think short-term use is not really an issue. The problem is longer-term use and or use in the very elderly. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just going, taking a step back to the sleep hygiene, uh, Tony Fernando and I did a little randomised trial, and I remember there was one lady there who was in the control group, and her advice was to have a regular time to go to bed, and she came back the week later just saying that was the best, you know, we were amazing. This wasn't the intervention. In fact, we were a bit irritated yeah. because yeah. You, you don't want yeah. the control group yeah. having a good response. You want yeah. them to have, you know, yeah. not, not do so well ideally. Uh, at least in the short term. So, but I've never forgotten <laughs> that woman. Just so grateful to us and how wonderful yeah. we were for. Yeah. And she was going to be like at eight o'clock at night, and then midnight, and then ten o'clock, and then eight o'clock, and you know. Oh, was, okay. So she was okay. sleep deprived some nights, and then she was spending too much time in bed. To, you know, it was just look, a chaotic yeah. pattern. The other thing I think you can never um, underestimate is the impact of anxiety about sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So somehow just simple things like getting into a routine and feel and, and kind of being told that those things are going to help you mm -hmm. can just be enough to allay that kind of thing around mm -hmm. starting to work up toward, towards bedtime mm -hmm. and then you're getting into the anticipatory anxiety mm -hmm. about oh, I'm going to have another night of lying mm -hmm. awake for three hours. I mean, the other thing, and I, I don't know if you've had experience of this, but I mean, I get a lot of people to go to the My Sleep Button site oh, okay. and yep. just learn that. Kind of strategy and I kind of talk to people about it as being like a modern version of counting sheep yes but it's again it's just mm. about actually taking you out of that anticipated mm. anxiety space mm. and into a, a you know a not hyper vigilant mental state mm. so that you are by just focusing on doing something boring well, one of my tricks actually is to put a I put the earbuds on and I listen to podcasts. Um, <laughs> you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful not to listen to something that's super. I tend to listen to history ones, which I quite like. Oh, right. But if yeah. I say, occasionally get a medical one that's just super inter interesting, I actually <laughs> find myself. Or well, the other yeah. thing is, you see, with the podcast, you can actually turn the timer on, and they'll go off after oh, yeah. 15 minutes. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you wake up in the morning, you've gone through 10 programs. Yeah. So, so it is a bit of a risk. Um, what are the alternatives to Zopiclone? Um, we talked about quetiapine before. Do you want to just say what you, what oh, your look, thoughts were about? Out, outside of severe persistent major depression with associated kind of anxiety and persistent severe insomnia, I, I and or as I was talking about, sometimes helping to bridge people off benzos, I think that in the acute space, there's very little, little indication for quetiapine. Mm -hmm. So I think that... Um, Zopiclone slash Tamazepam for insomnia only. Mm -hmm. For um, people where they're having really severe associated anxiety, lorazepam, mm -hmm. particularly if it's panic type anxiety, mm -hmm. because it's fast acting. And I mean, often actually, if people just experience lorazepam uh, aborting a panic attack, mm -hmm. um, and you just tell them to have it with them mm -hmm. and know it's there. Just that reassurance is enough along with having talked to them about breathing mm -hmm. to quite quickly control mm. particularly acute panic. And obviously for more severe persistent anxiety then a, a longer acting benzo for a short time. Like diazepam. Diazepam particularly or, mm. or perhaps clonazepam in small mm. doses. But um, you know I mean I, I really think for people out there who are, who are kind of having pe patients come in distressed by recent events. I would really discourage in the first instance jumping straight to prescribing mm. unless it's distressed to a degree of, you know, significant functional impairment um, where people are really, really struggling. Mm. I think the important thing is just to do the normalising self-care mm. advice as is in that document mm. uploaded on the on the ministry site. <laughs> <coughs> One of the things I sometimes do in these situations is do a PHQ-9, <coughs> although I'm working on an emotional quality of life score at the moment. And I'll mm. say to patients, if 100 is perfect emotional health and zero is terrible, where would you be now? It takes 15 seconds to administer. And if the scores are below 50, generally the PHQ-9 is above 12. So you've got a mood problem, whatever that right. may go. That right. just takes a few seconds to do. So yeah. you're not, I'm, not, I'm very conscious of time in primary care. You know, there's four people in the waiting room and I've got somebody who's just burst into tears in the office. Yes. Um, and one of the things I do with tears, those of you who have been to my fact courses will know, I say to people, if your tears were words, what would they what be, would they be saying? saying? Yeah. And they're just giving you the pain straight away. 
and you can do something about it then and there. Um, no, you know, you move the box of tissues across, but you don't let them cry. You get on with it. That must be terrible. Um, and then I, I have various procedures I do after that. Look, you um, talked about Jacinda. Con, con, I use the word containing yeah. the nation. Yeah. But I mean, in a way, the power of that is you are containing the person's yeah. distress, aren't you? Yeah, you're yeah. acknowledging it. You can say that must be terrible. That would yeah. be very painful. Yeah. Um, the um, yeah. No, so I think um, we. Uh, it's interesting training the medical students. They're a bit frightened of tears, but I think mm. um, this allows you to keep the show on the road. If you sit there for five minutes with the patient crying, you've lost 30% of your, con you know. And I don't think that's been inhumane. I think it's actually more humane to get in there because they're they're completely with that pain yeah. at the time. Yeah. And um, and you can get that's a that's a quote from again from David Cole from Vancouver. Uh, because the alternative is that after five minutes they're apologising for it. Absolutely. I'm and sorry. Which, which is I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> no, no need. No need for apologies. Yeah. Okay. More, more questions. Uh, what was that um, uh, website for sleep? You said it was my sleep. Oh, app. Uh, so anyone who just googles my sleep button, my sleep button. It's a, it's a technique called. Oh, Jesus, what's it called? Um. Oh, that's, my mind's got blank. But if you just Google my sleep button, you'll see it and. You'll see some of the research that sits behind mm. it, and it's just a very simple technique. Um, which you know, when I'm telling people to go there, I say it's just really a modern equivalent of the old counting sheep thing. The um, if someone can um, help David short-term memory, and you can remember what this technique was, put it put it in on the question. Yeah, button. yeah. But okay, so here's that question again. Uh, my patients who have pre-existing anxiety and depression appear to have more problems since the attack. Yep. Is it okay to explain the whole country is sad and this is when they may be feeling worse or does this belittle them, underlie, their underlying illness, for example, a patient with postnatal depression? Could you also please, I mute me, I'm not sure what that means, please. Anyway. Look, you know, I think there are two sides to this question. The first is that people who are experiencing persisting depression and anxiety will still have normal human reactions. Um, often, particularly people who experience depression tend to be the more sensitive souls among us, so often will um, be more vulnerable to being distressed by events like this. Um, and in fact, it's interesting that looking at the teens who've been more resilient and not, it's often teens who've experienced prior depression and anxiety who've been most distressed by mm -hmm. The recent events um, but um, so I think the first side of it is just to, to do the normalizing you're talking about in terms of you know we are all to varying degrees as a nation experiencing mm. emotional reactions to this event um, and to give the message that that will pass over mm. a week or two as it will for the rest of us but on the other hand I think the really important thing is to also say to the person but if actually your distress is persisting and if you're feeling that anxiety or depression are becoming more problematic, then that would say we should do something about it. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, increasingly as we see more of the reviews of the antidepressant literature, effectiveness, you know, the effectiveness being questioned for all but the most severe persistent depression, and also more and more and more as we see the power of brief kind of psychological mm. and other interventions in a primary care environment. I mean, hopefully um, that would then cue a bit of a review around what are our mm. options around how mm. to get you some more support. Mm. I mean, we have a, a, a short trial in our clinician just by getting people to be behaviorally activated, contacting friends, yep. doing some exercise, going and doing some things, not, not even doing any cognitive stuff. Numbers need to treat of three to get people better after a week. And look, um, in that vein, um, the journal, so the National yes. Depression Initiative, the journal, mm. is basically behavioural activation mm. in, a, in an online supported mm. toolkit. Mm. Um, and I think that um, we should use that more. It mm. doesn't get used as much as it could do. I mm. certainly use it a lot in my own practice. Mm. Um, the great thing is the fact that people set goals, get text reminders mm. to follow up on them. There's great information on there. Mm. But ideally, actually, the human touch of you getting on the phone or 
you know, another pra practice member, actually it can be the receptionist and the practice, mm. it can be the nurse, mm. it can be anyone getting on the phone and doing that follow-up around sticking with that program yeah. um, over the, the, the following some, week or two. Some very powerful research about short phone calls from yeah. primary care to patients. I always refer to it as sharing the love and say it's, yeah, it's like absolutely. the Pope or the Queen calling you. Honestly, people are so thrilled usually that Look, somebody I, from the practice is I remember in the early days of my time in primary care, William Ferguson, dear friend, classmate, GP, um, bringing an article out of the BMJ by a woman GP who Kate developed McCall. a severe yeah. depression. Yeah. And she talked about, you know, you unthinkingly tell me to come back in two weeks mm. when I'm in a space where one day living like this is an unimaginable. And she used the term living in a Dali landscape. Yeah, living, living in a living Dali, in a Dali landscape. landscape. I, I put it, it's, it's, yeah. it's a favourite quote of mine. You know, yeah. I'm very fond of William for putting it. It's a yeah. wonderful paper. It's called The Insider's Guide to Depression. Yeah. We'll add that to the website. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I think that was an incredibly powerful message. But to me, it's part of how I make sense mm. of why those few phone calls mm. have such powerful therapeutic effect. Yeah. In fact, the research says it's as effective as SSRIs. So. And, and it's up to six months. None of the drug studies go that long. Yeah. And actually, <laughs> right. it's, it, numbers need to treat a five at six months. I mean, that's yeah. better than drugs. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we'll put Insider's Guide to Depression. Yeah, the quote goes like this, see us soon. Um, a, a, a week is a long time inside a Dali landscape. Yeah. Three weeks is an eternity, unimaginable. Yeah. is unimaginable, yeah. insufferable. Yeah. Okay, got some more questions here. Um, normalizing self-care will help many people, but given how overloaded our mental health system is, is this event going to also add a burden that is, that is unable to cope with? So um, certainly, um, local Christchurch um, primary mental health response has been reached capacity pretty quickly. Um, so the telehealth service had anyway been um, testing and developing phone delivered um, talking therapies. Um, and so there was gonna be, and that was already accessible from the Canterbury area. There's gonna be extended access to that service. Um, so it's basically a package of talking therapies delivered over the phone and the evaluation showed that it was as effective as face to face um, and actually had an almost zero DNA rate, mm. was highly, uh, people highly valued it and actually um, surprisingly the anonymity made it feel much more acceptable of talking to someone over the phone. Um, so we're, we're gearing up to provide more of that and particularly um, linking <laughs> through our networks into the Muslim counsellor, psychologist, psychotherapist workforce to get them providing these um, packages of care um, um, as part of the team because it's based on an internet based platform that people can do working from home. So I mean yeah, yes is the answer on the one hand but on the other hand things are being geared up to be able to help respond to that increased need. Our organisers said that um, resources website links are in the chat window. Um, My Sleep Button is based on cognitive science called the cognitive, cognitive shuffle. shuffle. That's the cognitive yes, shuffle. Yes. Okay. And what was the journal toolkit, please? That's depression.org. Oh, that's so, so no, so it's the National Depression Initiative website, which is www.depression.org.nz. Mm -hmm. And it's worth going and having a look at for, for everyone out there. Mm. But basically for those of you who haven't, there's a series of tiles with a face on it. Mm -hmm. And behind each of them is the person's story about their journey through depression and their recovery. Mm. Um, so very hopeful kind of messages, mm -hmm. partly around normalising, around giving people a sense you're not alone with it. And then out of that um, homepage, you then, as well as information, will get links through the journal. And the journal is the revamped version of the original John Kerwin fronted um, um, program that takes people through basic education about depression and then choices of either increasing exercise as a goal, eating healthy, um, or brief problem solving or managing anxiety, I think are the four options there. And people set goals and then get text or email reminders encouraging them from JK. But actually, as well as John Kerwin, there are a number of other people who now comprise the, the, those giving the messages over that um, revamped version. It was originally, you needed a PC, but actually now it's also in a mobile friendly format mm -hmm. as well. So it's a really great tool, and I mean, I think should be part of the routine care of every mm. person presenting mm. with depression or anxiety in this country. Mm. Um, mm. What what the outcome 
analysis shows is that people who stick with the program for more than four or five sessions actually have really good outcomes in terms of reduced symptom scores. The big challenge is to keep people engaged. So mm -hmm. partly mm -hmm. the whole program has been revamped to make it more user friendly, but it's those phone calls I think that also have a big mm -hmm. um, impact mm -hmm. on keeping people engaged. Um, got a, um, a, a question, a comment here just saying remember that we've got 300 primary care nurses who are credentialed to focus on mental health. Oops, and many of these uh, are funded for extensive cult That's consults, right. nurse-led clinics, clinics, and do follow-ups. Yes, no, I think I think nurses are a key link yep. in mental health and primary care. Yep. Underused by and large, but when used, can do fabulous work. You know, in my experience coming into primary care 15 or where and whenever it was years ago, was the practice nurses mm. thought that they didn't have experience or skills in managing mental health issues in primary care. Actually, as I got to know them, what I realized is they had a lot of really great skills and knowledge, but they had very low confidence in those that skills and knowledge. So, I mean, I think part of the value of that credentialing program is not only been giving mm -hmm. people actually some extra skills, but just actually helping them to realize that they mm -hmm. already have a lot of mm -hmm. skills and knowledge. It's been a fantastic initiative and um, mm -hmm. certainly, um, the practices that I'm involved in that have one of them in there, they really do great work. So, and one of the challenges I do when I do my fact workshop is say you need to use this tomorrow because if you don't, you probably wasted being yeah, here yeah. today. Yeah, you need to better and, go back. And that worries me a little bit. So a lot of these trainings is people need to have the confidence, and I, I hope our nursing colleagues have the confidence to use the skills the next day. Well, look, certainly though, part of the credentialing. I presume nationally, certainly in the northern region, has been also been connected up with a mental health nurse supervisor, so they get that ongoing support to translate what they've learned into practice. Mm. Um, somebody's just putting down headspace here, which I think is a that's a an so ad head, you have to pay for, but it's pretty good, isn't it? It's it's free initially, and then there is a small cost to it. Mm. Headspace is really great. The other place that's got a lot of great resources is the Auckland University. Um, Calm website. Calm website. Mm. So that's mm. got that's got mindfulness mm. apps on it. It's got a lot of good information and a lot of other resources mm. for particularly anxiety, insomnia. Mm. It's depression. got a particularly good one by a woman called Sharon Salzberg. She's an American, um, and it's got it's a loving kindness meditation. And we had Barbara Fredrickson out here a couple of years ago. She's the big help, uh, positive psychology person, mm. and Sharon Salzberg is his, her go-to consultant for. Um, I'd quite like to get her out at some point. But it's a lovely thing. May I, may I be safe, may I be healthy, may I be happy, may I live with ease. And she talks about where you're focusing and putting your attention. What are you focusing on? Are you focusing on what went wrong, what you didn't say right, a person you didn't speak to? Um, where is your attention now? Is it on the next email? Am I wondering about the next question I'm going to ask you? It's, yeah. it's a, it's a yeah. beautiful one. So that was put together by Tony Fernando, who many of you all know, the sleep um, psychiatrist, and Fiona Moyer, who's the former Scottish GP and based in our department. So it's called www.calm.auckland.ac.nz. And they get all sorts of traffic from all over the yeah, world on yeah. that one. Just going to make a point, that thing about somebody being very distressed is a nice thing we say in ACT, is that it's the flip side. It's like the other side of the hand. You're, you're suffering because you care. Mm. Like, actually, yeah. if you don't care about something, you don't suffer. Yeah. And none of us suffer about things we don't care about. But when we do care about something deeply, we suffer deeply. And I think that's quite a nice line to say to somebody, well, you know, I can see you're caring very deeply about this and it's affected you hugely, that's really a sign of just how important this is to it. And I get that completely. I think that's a very validating thing to say to people. Look, you know, there is no life without suffering, is there? No. Basically. But, we, li but, but, but we live in an era where, and I mean, obviously excessive suffering is is an awful thing to have to live with. Um, mm. But we live in an era where people are almost allergic to suffering. And um, and so become more than usually distressed by it. Yeah. And yeah. up to a point, I think what you're talking about partly is then around how to partly normalise it, mm. isn't it? Mm. Um, mm. Rather than us then engaging in it and further awfulizing it by mm. diagnosing it or by mm. <laughs> doing all these other things we can easily do. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so the telehealth, that's a... 
a nationwide service, is it 1737? Yes, so the National Telehealth Service is the um, bringing together of a whole lot of previously disparate telephone-based health services. So things like um, drug alcohol helpline, the um, smoking cessation, quit line, um, the depression line, health line. So what was the general health mm -hmm. nurse run information? Mm -hmm. The former um, ProCare After Hours nurse line. Um, and they were all brought together under one umbrella um, and um, with a national focus for the majority of mm -hmm. them. So yes, 1737 Depression Line are nationally available, free to call um, counselling services that are available 24-7. Actually, in the context of rural health particularly, I really kind of, the message I gave to rural GPs was to think of 1737 as like a virtual member of your team. Mm. So seeing people who are distressed, just and they're, they're people who don't need a crisis team number, mm. but having 1737 as a place to go mm. when you are experiencing distress, and really what it is, is one-off intervention with an open door to come back. Mm. Um, mm. And um, so, but I mean, in a way, you, you could say that of, of urban general practice of any primary care setting, really, to think of it as, as um, a, a virtual member of the team. Healthline do um, um, send notes back into GP records. We are looking across the MHA lines at doing the same thing <coughs> next year as well to, to mm. kind of enhance that sense mm. of being part of the same team. Mm. Um, Sophie, just to remind us about Health Navigator. Health Navigator yeah. is a wonderful site with all sorts of um, tools and things there, so it's worth exploring that. Um, we've got a question here about does the acute distress consultation, is that covered by ACCs? And I don't think it is, is it? I think there has to be a, 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 a I don't know, do you know? Um, look, my understanding is that the mental injury question is mental injury that is caused by or relates to a physical injury um, and or um, being mm. victim of crime. Because I think there was a, it was just so, on the radio today just saying some people had made a claim and because there wasn't a physical inju injury, they weren't eligible yep. for ACC. So yep. I, I don't know, maybe the government's going to look at that. But, um, but um, yeah, so... so I, mean, I mean, the, the big alternative kind of support link that is there, though, is victim support. Um, so for both, um, for people affected, really, first, you know, people passing by the, the kind of people who were injured but have survived and so on. Question here, how to deal with a patient with suicidal ideation but not made any plans? And I guess that's a everyday thing in primary care, isn't it? I mean, yeah. if you do a PHQ-9 on people, you pick it up all the time. People often tick the one, two yeah. or three yeah. box. So look, I mean, I guess the thing about um, the space is that suicidal thoughts are very common, mm -hmm. particularly in times of distress and or depression. Mm -hmm. Suicidal behaviour is less common, but still relatively mm. common, mm. whereas actually completed suicide is thankfully incredibly rare, mm. albeit still far too common. Um, so I guess the question is where you can draw the line between mm. um, someone who is going to be safe and someone who may be mm. at risk, which I guess mm. is what the question was about. Mm. So, I mean, I, I approach that by, of, at some point, if, if someone is distressed, just saying, look, I mean, you're obviously going through a pretty terrible time. Have things got to the point where you feel you can't go on? And if the answer to that is yes, just get increasingly more specific. So have you actually had thoughts of hurting yourself or ending your life? Have you thought about how you might do that? Mm. Have you felt on the verge of acting on that? And have you ever um, recently or in the past made an attempt on your life? Mm. Um, and then the last question is, do you, on the one hand, are there things to stop you? Yes, yeah, mitigating factors. Yep. On the yeah. other hand, do you feel that people around you would be better off if you were no longer mm. around, yeah. um, which probably is the most... I remember you saying that on a podcast. Yeah. I know where I was in Vancouver when I heard that. I was walking through the bush, <laughs> and I heard you say it on a podcast. I thought that's actually a really, really important one. So, so, so it's that threshold between having thoughts mm. but not having felt at risk of or having intention to act. Mm. And obviously, if you have feel at risk of or having intent to act, is the mm. crisis team mm. point. Um, below that is not, 
and particularly if there are protective factors. Mm. So, you know, mm. I feel, I do have thoughts that I'd rather be dead, but I know the harm it would do my family, I would mm. never do it. Mm. Um, but I mean, I think that lower level is where we just, start, we just have cards which have the local crisis line for mm. if you feel acutely at risk, or 1737 mm. if you are just struggling in that moment, mm. um, but mm. not acutely at risk. And the thing is, 1737 will link people through to police and or mm. crisis teams as required, mm. including, if necessary, breaking glass to do mm. that. So, um, and they can find people on their phones too, can't they? They can track people down. Yep, yep. So basically, they're not uncommonly calling police who mm. with, with a phone number mm. for police to use the cell phone tracking to then mm. locate them. Yep. Mm. Uh, Ross Harris, the ACT guy from Australia, has a, a very nice line about this. He says, there's part of you that doesn't want to kill yourself, and that's the bit I'd like to work with now. Yeah. And I think yeah, that just nice that point. just reframes it. Yeah. Another one I got from the UK was that it's probably you just want to get rid of this pain. You don't really want to kill yourself. Yeah. And that's usually what is going on for people. Actually, they yeah. don't want to kill themselves, but the pain is so great. That's right. That's they just want right. to get rid of it. I think there are a couple of little reframes there, and I sense that in people. I, I sense a, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it gives Look, it's a bit more positive for me too, rather than you know escalating the you know yeah. what are you going to do and have you done anything? I mean, and, that, and that's important to do, of yeah. course, but it actually feels a little bit more constructive to flip it round yeah, and, and go that point. way. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're um, is the one seven three seven number. Always available or just since the 15th of no, March? No, it's been going for quite a number of years now, available to anyone anywhere in the country 24-7, 365 days a year. It's um, provided by a mix of staff based in Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch and Dunedin, plus some who work from home. So the, the IT platform the service works from can be um, set up in people's homes as well. The question here about peak councillors wanting to be part of 1737 that aren't in Auckland, can they be based? Yeah, yeah. so the team is basically a national one. Um, mm. There are people based in pretty much every province of the country, those outside of the main centres working from home by and large. Um, in fact, I mean, we, we would have been absolutely slammed um, over the past week, 10 days now, were it not for the incredible generosity of our colleagues from the other mm. sectors. So we've had 70 people who have basically volunteered to come in and boost the service um, out of ProCare and My East Tamaki Healthcare team, Auckland and Waitamata DHB, um, and people who have just, you know, people in private practice have just contacted us and volunteered. Mm. So, I mean, it's, it, it was a hell of an exercise getting geared up to actually get all that extra workforce given a very brief induction and on the phone and text line. But actually, um, it, it's been an incredible, you know, example of the generosity of mm. Kiwis when mm. the chips are down, really. I, mm. mean, I was just overwhelmed with the number of people who really put themselves forward. Um, okay, so is Safe to Talk part of your telemedicine group? Do you, that make Yes, sense? I forgot to mention Safe to Talk. So Safe to Talk is an MSD funded initiative which got going last year, which is, it's basically the sexual harm helpline. So it is there for people wanting help, advice, signposting to services around either recent or past sexual harm. Um, uh, how do you help Muslim people who are frightened that this might happen again? Is, is it still talking about their feelings? Yeah, look, I, I think, so before the advice went up, we had it reviewed by a quite senior Muslim psychologist. Mm -hmm. And apart from agreeing with the fact that we shouldn't put the advice in there about alcohol and drug use, mm -hmm. she basically said the same basic stuff applies. Um, mm -hmm. So what we should be doing is reassuring, just, you know, I mean, it's a bit like, Everyone's scared of the aeroplane flight, but the most dangerous thing they do is drive to the airport. Absolutely. It's just reminding That's right. people Getting that, those risks that, that, that this was an incredibly isolated mm. event, that, um, mm. that you, you are probably safer right now than at any other time also because of the increased police vigilance and well, that's right. you know, the monitoring of, of web traffic that will be going mm. on and all of that. Mm. Um, but then it's beyond that, it's just those same bits of self-care advice, most particularly 
you described it as reaching out, not going mm. in. Mm. So um, mm. but reaching out to your own national supports, um, your own social supports, I mean, and um, just kind of talking about how you feel. I mean, the, the other thing that's really helpful for people is to kind of remind them that we're all going through a tough time and you reaching out and sharing how you feel gives the person you're doing that to permission to do the same. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, you're coming up. Yeah. I'm, 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 um, so just a comment here. Somebody wanted, uh, <coughs> didn't think suicide was rare, but I think maybe just putting that in perspective, you'd said that suicide so, was so, rare. So she, she says it's a national epidemic. Yeah, so yeah. you want to just re-comment on that? Or? Yep. So mm. it was really the statistical thing. Mm. So um, suicidal thinking um, at least 40, if not more, percent of us will have significant suicidal thinking at some point of our life. Yeah, but only around probably, depending on how you define it, mm. if you include self-harming and mm. so on, maybe 10 or a few more percent actually um, make some kind of attempt around self-harm mm -hmm. suicide. But the actual completed suicide rate is around, you know, a number per 10,000. Mm. population mm. Um, so I mean statistically it is rare mm. but it is still it, I mean the thing to understand though is that suicide there are things we could do as a nation mm. that would reduce mm. suicide rate mm. so there's been um, and and there are things both in the um, in the prevention promotion space mm. in fact if there was one single thing that we could do to greatly reduce the suicide rate and also greatly reduce probably half the numbers of people needing mental health services in their life, it would be to ensure every child had a healthy pregnancy, so they're healthy mm -hmm. in utero, and were safe and loved for the first three years of their life. And doing that would actually halve everything, including likely the suicide rate. Certainly it halves self-harming mm. behaviour rates. Um, so... Um, but beyond that, I mean, there's a methodology called zero suicide, which has been taken on by, by service systems in the States mm. and has shown significant reductions in suicide. Mm. Um, mm. And that's more around how you manage kind of suicidal thinking behavior. Mm. That's a really mm. whole of systems approach that, yeah. for example, in the, the, the VA Air Force services, I think, in the States, by implementing this methodology across their whole health system, they saw a huge decrease mm. in VA mm. suicides. So, mm. um, yeah. Well, I know in Australia they've got a national trial going on there to reduce suicide, and they're looking at 10 different interventions, simple things like putting fences up around cliffs where people yeah. jump off. Um, so that's one of the few things with evidence. It's actually restricting mm. access to means. Yeah. Via um, firearms, getting, bridges, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, that sort of stuff. So they're, they're doing a whole lot of little things, and they think all that will add up to a 30% reduction. This is um, uh, Helen Christensen from the yeah. Black Dog Institute, who was out here recently talking about it. Um, so it often requires public health, yeah. uh, public services. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I've, I've had a couple of patients commit suicide and I think that's probably I think as a psychiatrist it's much more uh, par for the course I think the average GP may have one or two patients commit suicide in their career but it's uh, well yeah, they were situations that were were beyond what anything I could do or, or said or did um, look I mean you see far more people mm. we see more people at risk mm. but so in my um, my 35 years I guess it must be pretty close mm. to now um, I have had three people who I had actually been directly seeing who've ended their lives. Mm. Um, so it's still a relatively mm. rare thing. Mm. I mean, the thing about zero suicide, though, is it's it's about starting with the understanding that we cannot predict risk. No, no. And so we've, it's, it's mm. futile to think we can. But what we can do is we can manage the factors that can mm. get people to the point where they act. Mm well enough to significantly reduce mm. chances and certainly there is a bundle of things and one of them is around where possible restricting access to means mm. uh, somebody asked about why didn't we talk about alcohol and drug we did at the beginning and we said be careful not to get into alcohol and drugs again not for a, i always say to patients it's not a moral point of view it's actually a health point of view on camera i, I don't particularly care if you use alcohol or drugs 
per se from a moral point of view, yeah. but from your health point of view, if you're distressed and you start using that, it's part of the avoidance and the avoidance is feeding the tiger. Um, and that's only going to make things worse. So you've got to not feed the tiger, basically. Look, the other thing, which, as you, I think, said earlier, people identify with is that it might make you feel better in the moment, but actually, in the longer scheme of things, mm. is it making you feel better or worse? Yeah, it's very much a short-term avoidant fix. Yeah. Um, and, um, but, and then you say to people, does it help? And it really is amusing when they say no you know invariably i've only had one person who drank a lot of alcohol and said it helped mm. but she was a woman who'd been incredibly abused as a child and was literally living in the back of a house and um you know was, was extremely avoidant um just somebody suggesting dialing 111 or requesting ambulance service is also an option for someone who is feeling the urgent need for assistance um probably better to call 1737 wouldn't you than calling the ambulance i just think yeah, um, look is, would that be something you'd want to encourage dialing 111 or? I mean, um, if it is that first responder response, then for better or worse, um, police, I think, are a better option. There was under the former government, so I'm sure it will see the light of day again, um, a plan to trial putting mental health workers into police um, teams mm. to allow for a joint police mental health worker mm. um, urgent outreach and, mm. I, and I think that that is something that has been done and has made an incredible difference in other countries yep. and that we do need to do here mm. but I mean really police are much better equipped to respond than ambulance yep. in the first instance where it is truly life or death yes if it's less than life or death then but you but someone is acutely at risk then a crisis mm. team is the best mm. first port of call. Mm. The problem is the crisis teams sometimes are busy and they're away. Mm. And mm. at least if you get through to 1737, they can help to navigate you too. Yeah. Um, because the other part of the telehealth service is the so-called early mental health response. Mm -hmm. And that is both diverting calls from ambulance and um, police to mental health clinicians where it is mental health related call. Mm -hmm. But also um, they are linked into and provide after hours um, phone um, coordinated service for quite a number of DHB's mental health services. Mm. Um, mm. So 1737 EMHR are, are part of the same mm. continuum of services. Mm. So we at 1737 can connect people mm. through to local crisis teams as well. Mm. Yes, well, I, I was in, worked in mental health in Vancouver 30 years ago. And we used to, the police used to have a mental health nurse that yeah. cruise around the car all night. And they only call us in if somebody needed committing or something, um, mm. something serious. So it was. Um, so you're right. It does. Um, I don't think that exists here, does it? There's no. no, um, no it hasn't. And I think the police would find that quite oh, look, reassuring, yeah. and um, the mental health community would. Find police that really, really wanted it because, I mean, actually, I think that mostly the police do an amazingly good job when they're called out to people who are suicidal or at risk. Um, mm. But you know. They feel incredibly ill-equipped to do that. Mm. They don't really have the training to, mm. to, to know how to do it well. So it just seems a no-brainer, really, to, mm. for them to be able to partner with mm. a, a mental health nurse mm. Um, mm. to be mm. able to provide a, a, a better service. Well, it would be a, a, a big ask for, a, for a, a fairly new recruit, wouldn't it, and the police yep. force to do that. Just got a question. What do you do about people using... Um, uh, the um, the events to seek drugs. I think you just have to try and sniff those out. Don't yeah, you? Yeah, you have to keep yeah. the radar up. Yeah, yeah. Well, look. <coughs> I, mean, I, I think though that the message here is that um, mostly drugs are not going to actually facilitate your recovery. Um, I mean, it's interesting that I mean we're talking about self care rather than therapy anyway. But there's quite interesting evidence that if you are on benzodiazepines, that cognitive behaviour therapy is a complete waste of time. Mm. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, th I think you've just got to have a way of, of mm. re ways of rationalising um, mm. why prescribing right now isn't going to be helpful. But of course, people who are genuinely drug seeking will be able to, you know, tell all the stories about not sleeping and stress and so on. Mm. Um, and I guess you've just got to do what you would do in any other circumstance under those. I mean, there are some signs out there that are people you don't know. Yeah, that's um, right. New practice, don't know them. And I remember in the last time I was 
conned by somebody they walked out without paying and that's actually uh, ah, that, that, that's interesting or they slam the door if you say no so there's a there there are certain signs it, it, people it, tend to feign symptoms these days to get narcotics they don't uh, I guess they could come in and say, I'm not sleeping, I'm acutely yeah. distressed and yeah. I need something to help me sleep. So, so certainly new to the practice, yeah. you tend to want to say no. Is TIS safe national or is there equivalent down the country? I because don't obviously know. That's, think... that's the simple thing to do is yeah. to just go on a test safe and that'll tell you, you know, yeah. there's someone who yeah. A, have been getting benzos or other mm. substance of abuse mm. and B, doctor shopping or... Yeah, or ask the name of the doctor they saw last and then call them up. Yeah. And that can be quite interesting because if they say they don't know them, then then, um, you know, you're, you're away, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, but I think it is difficult. Um, the thing is, the patient's pharmacology is better than yours, then, um, then you know you're probably dealing with somebody. You know, if they're asking yeah. for name, yeah. name drugs, yeah, yeah. Uh, or they've, they've lost their prescription of Zopoclone yeah, or, yeah, yeah. So from or out of Oxynorm. Town, yeah. From out of yeah. town, lost my yeah. prescription. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You don't get the time zone thing here. People come in from other time zones and say, you know, my doctor in Alberta used to prescribe this, and they come to they come to you in Vancouver after four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, so some more questions. Self care, awesome. Um, what is test safe? Test safe. Uh, oh. This is from someone in New Plymouth, um, Taranaki. It's not a national thing. There must be some way, presumably, in other DHBs of finding so, out what. So test safe is the Auckland region system whereby you can look up and see blood test results and dispensed medicines across the community, primary and secondary space. How do you forget what you're seeing? Well, okay, one of the lines I use is that there's no delete button in the human brain. Technically, you can't delete it. All you can do is learn something else to help co compensate with that. So if you're talking um, about the kind of flashbacks, PTSD, intrusive yeah, memory of yeah, PTSD. Yeah. Yeah, look, and, and trying to get someone to forget that is, is doesn't help. No, no, no. They need exposure to it. Acutely, though, so if we're talking about people with those PTSD symptoms acutely after a traumatic event, mm. the important thing is to actually normalise it, number one. Number two, to say that for the vast majority of people it will pass. And then number three, give those basic self-care messages. Mm. Um, mm. Because if you are distracted in work, if you are um, exercising, if you are you know, talking mm. to someone, mm. then you're unlikely to get them. It's mm. when you're in your reflective internal mm. space mm. that they're likely to come. So mm. so getting yourself out of that space, however you do it, is the most helpful thing to mm. do. I think the really important thing is for people to know oh, that it doesn't mean you're going crazy. Yes. Um, it will pass for the vast yeah. majority of people. Mm. It may take a few days to a week or two. Mm -hmm. Okay, question here. Test safe prescribing history, a big red flag. Uh, you can suppress your test safe prescribing history, a big red flag for new patients and drug seekers. Didn't so I guess if you see, uh, presumably there's some way that'll come up on, on test safe. Presumably there's other systems around the country. Yeah. We're, we're, we're all a bit siloed here, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, this yeah. is a bit crazy. Um, so, well, we're just about running out of time. So David, do you want to maybe, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, <laughs> um, I think, um, uh, Okay, so we've just got, I had the crisis team prescribe olanzapine for distress, severe anxiety in the last two months on SSRI and was taking benzos without much benefit. Your thoughts on olanzapine? Um, look, I mean, olanzapine to DHB mental health services, with apologies to any DHB mental health colleagues who may be out there, is a bit like vitamin O. <laughs> I mean, they seem to prescribe it for everything. Mm. Um, um, so, I mean... Personally, I would very rarely use olanzapine for someone mm. who was distressed and suffering from depression. Mm. Um, I think that, um, uh, um, firstly, what did you say that they were on antidepressant wise? SSRI, SSRI. SSRI. Yeah. yeah, and taking benzos. So if someone's on an SSRI and benzos and they're still distressed, struggling enough to be on to be needing another medication, then really what it means is go back to scratch and to say, okay, how do we understand what's going on here? I mean, have we missed a diagnosis somewhere along the line? Is this maybe drug alcohol induced? Mm. Or, or um, is there something situational that we're not understanding that is making us do this? <laughs> or if not, then clearly the drugs aren't working yep. and it's time to actually move on. Um, mm. So... You know, I mean, we, we talk historically about 20 milligrams of an SSRI for two to three weeks and then 40 for another two to three weeks, and if they're not responding, move on. 
Actually, I, I've even recently condensed that down more and said that, mm. you know, two weeks at 20, two weeks at 40, if things are not improving, move on. Because some um, of the guidelines are just going to another SSRI, and it yep. seems to me a bit ridiculous. Well, yep. I, I, well, I actually, actually change yeah. classes. Look, uh, that's a, that's, I do too. Yep. But if you're completely rational about it, mm. tolerance and response to one SSRI has almost no zero productivity for another. Mm. And the reason is that unlike, for example, tricyclics, which were a much more kind of uniform mm. group of, of drugs, actually the SSRIs are quite a disparate group of mm. drugs. They're just com they, they're unified mm. by having that serotonin specific reuptake action. Mm. Um, so um, I, I, you know, rationally, because I mean, mm. you, you I saw someone today who has had a long journey with quite severe debilitating depression mm -hmm. and um, he'd, had, he'd had two SSRIs before I even saw mm -hmm. him. Well, he read on and he's got nowhere with mm -hmm. all the stuff we've done. He's been to mindfulness. He's had quite a lot mm -hmm. of CBT, <coughs> a lot of medication. He is exercising. He's still debilitated by depression. He read online somewhere about sertraline and said, could I try this? And I said, well, nothing else we've, we've done so far has worked. Why not? Mm -hmm. And you know, is that just the natural course of a cycle mm -hmm. ending? Is it the placebo effect? I don't know, but blow me down four weeks later, he's <laughs> feeling somewhat better. I guess guess my concern about a lansipine in this sort of primary care setting is it messes with the metabolic. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. have a patient with a total cholesterol of 12 on 2.5 of a lansipine. Yep. Now, I don't know whether he's got a lipid problem. I'm trying to get his genetic testing done because he's got a very high LDL, but um, this is a guy who's 39. And he's staring down the barrel of a myocardial so look, infarction. For really very acute, high level mm -hmm. distress, agitation, driven by psychosis or mm. by, you know, mania, mm. Um, mm. actually olanzapine is phenomenally effective. Mm. Okay. It reduces distress, it gives some mm. level of sedation. Um, mm. So I think that's why it's got such traction at the mm. acute end of the spec mm. system. But but this kind of context, I don't see it as yep. really having a, a much of a role yep. at all, yep. personally. Yep. Um, so if, if anything in that space, you might kind of be thinking, well, we've been benzos, you know, the person has been using for a wee while, should we be actually getting them onto a little bit of quetiapine? Mm. But apart mm. from anything else, it's actually what else do we need to do to, to address the underlying rethink. problem? Rethink. Well, I think it's like anything in medicine. If, if the person is not getting better, you need to go back and rethink the yeah. diagnosis yeah. and maybe get a second opinion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in our yeah. clinic, we, we get a second doctor to have a look <laughs> at the patient um, or talk to, to talk to a psychiatrist or the mental health team. Yeah. So do you like, we'd like just to sum up now, David, because we're, we're at quarter to nine. Just sum up what you what you've sort of said tonight, and uh, remind us of what the resources are again. Yep. So look, I guess what I'm saying, particularly with reference back to the um, the terror attack in Christchurch last Friday, it's really that um, many people locally and across the country will be experiencing distress and may rock up to their GP as a result because of insomnia or feelings of distress or post-traumatic type symptoms. So the first message is really, it's important to normalize that, to generalize it to being shared among many of our fellow um, Kiwis, um, and that there are some general things that will help and some things that are unhelpful. So what would help being reaching out to your natural supports and actually sharing how you feel, sticking to your normal routines, distracting yourself into activity, um, and um, the last one's gone from my head. It must be the time of night. And the things not to do are to talk over and over the detail of what happened. If, if you find yourself ruminating about that, use distraction. Um, or indeed having the kind of post-traumatic symptoms, use distraction. And the second thing is to avoid going to drugs and alcohol as mm. a, a coping thing. Mm. Um, but then all of that said, I think the other really important message is that there will be a subset of people who either by na the, the nature of this trauma for them now and or, and normally at the end, um, having past traumatic experience and or PTSD and or major depression, who this may well trigger them back into um, decompensating. And, and generally the sign of that is actually functional impairment. So yes. if people are really struggling across functioning mm. in, the, in their range of role responsibilities, then that's a sign to reach out for help. So for acute PTSD, um, the re restoring sleep, 
mm. and access to the range of talking therapies, including cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness, some more ACT based um, techniques is generally the most effective thing. Mm -hmm. And the role for medication is really only when it's mm -hmm. antidepressants is only when it's either very severe PTSD or very persistent. Very persistent. Yeah. Okay, David. Well, um, thank you very much for coming in Pleasure, and Bruce. working with us tonight. And I'd just like to thank the audience for asking such a lot of questions. We didn't have a presentation tonight because David and I realized we could probably just go on talking and doing cases, which I think is a nice way to well, learn. We never even got to actually talk about well, the cases, did we? Well, the we audience is very happy, experienced, but, and I think yeah. often just asking questions is what people yeah. uh, people want. Yeah. Um, so, um, okay, so we'll, we'll put some of the resources up on the link, and remember to sign up for Red Whale, Red Whale at the end of August. So thank you very much. Over and out from us.